Well, um, it is actually really, really good to see you guys again tonight, to be able to have the opportunity to uh, speak to you uh, both the Sunday morning and the, and the Sunday evening. Uh, this month is going to be, I think, so it's something different than I've ever done before. Um, I'm, we're just going to be doing some, some teaching and some walking through what it means to be part of this community, uh, what it means to be part of the Wesleyan Church. Um, I am, uh, I've been part of the Wesleyan Church all my life. Uh, so when I think about what it means to be a Wesleyan, it, it's like breathing to me, all right? It just comes naturally. I, I um, was a Wesleyan the moment I was born. Um, and so, yeah, amen. I don't know, maybe it's an amen. I'm not for sure. But uh, so, um, but um, it's good to be a part of a denomination. Um, I know there's a lot of independent churches out there that do great, great ministry, great work, but it's good to be part of a denomination because a denomination has a history of, of experience, experiences together. It has a, a group of people that have been working through what it, what it means to, to be part of that community and that denomination, what, it, what we believe in. And, uh, and so we're going to be looking um, at some of those things um, this month. One of the things that has happened in, in re recently in the past few months is there has been a, um, a process that has began to take place on what it means to be a member of the Wesleyan Church. Now, we um, uh, at Brookhaven, there's a lot of people that um, are, are not members. They come, they attend, they're part of the community, they're, they're no less part of the community. But the Wesleyan Church has... Um, actual membership. And the membership in the Wesleyan Church is significant for a couple of reasons, or for, for several reasons. There's lots of things that it entails, but um, there are certain positions within the church that, that you can become that you can be involved in or that you can lead when you're a, when you're a member. Um, really historically, that was designed to um, help the church not fall prey to, to heresies and to people uh, teaching things that were not in line with what we believed as a church. And so we, um, uh, as a church, established membership. And um, that way, before you were a part of certain positions within the church, you, you had some teaching or some training on what it meant to be a, a, a member or part of that community. And so historically, that's part of what has been part of the membership process. But there has been this change, there's been this um, a process that has taken place that has actually changed and transformed what it means to be a, a member of the Wesleyan Church. Now, before you go and panic, um, we have not we have not changed our stance on on biblical truths. In fact, our stance on biblical truth are, are just as strong today as as they've ever been. In fact, in um, every four years we have um, in the Wesleyan Church, we have what is called a general conference. And um, at the end of every general conference, um, uh, it's been a long-standing tradition. Um, this book is released. It is the discipline of the Wesleyan Church. If you're ever just really bored and you need something to do, I can get you a copy of the discipline of the Wesleyan Church, and you'll have something to do in your spare time. But um, every uh, time there's a general conference, there is um, one of these books published. It it lays out our um, our statements of faith, our articles of religion, our elementary principles. Um, uh, our core, some of our core values, and, and it lays it out. And uh, but what, the thing that has changed is what it means to become a member. And um, what I want to do now, Ed, Dr. Ed Hoover, who um, is part of our our, our church, um, he has been the one that has always, or in recent time, not always, but recently has taught our membership class. Uh, and he has a, a long history in the Wesleyan Church. And um, Ed Hoover has put together a video, and then we'll I'll unpack it a little bit afterwards. He has put together um, a video that explains the model change and the transition that is that has taken place. And I, I just want us to to watch this. We will unpack it. Um, you will hear some more of this later in the month in the AM services as um, 
I will be talking about it there a little bit as well. But as I look across the room, not all of you, but when I look across the room, I see many members of Brookhaven who have been members of a long time, have been members a long time. Um, and I just wanted to give you the first, this is the preview, all right? And uh, you get the inside scoop a little bit. But, and so Victor, um, if you could just run that video and um, we will just talk a little bit about this, about this change. Membership in the Wesleyan Church. The Wesleyan Church has wrestled with the membership requirements for decades. Several membership designations have been used over the years. Membership requirements and categories have been based on tradition as much as or more than on scripture. The Wesleyan Church has followed a path that can best be described like this, believe, become, and then belong. Basically, we have said, if you can demonstrate that you are living a sanctified life, you can belong to us. We are raising up a strong, vibrant, active group of Christians who love the Lord and love the church, and they cannot understand how we got so far away from the New Testament church in our membership requirements. In the New Testament church, when a person became a believer, they were automatically brought into the fellowship of the church and the body of Christ. That happened on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter 2. Those who believed what Peter said were baptized and added to the church that day about 3,000 in all. Throughout Paul's ministry, he followed this same At the 2016 General Conference, changes to the Wesleyan Church Constitution regarding membership were recommended. The new membership plan became effective at the publishing of the 2016 Discipline. The new path to membership in the Wesleyan Church, believing, belonging, and becoming, is now in place. The church now accepts new believers who have a desire to grow and become more like Christ much earlier than before. The requirements for membership are confession of faith in Jesus Christ and a commitment to pursue holiness in all things. Christian baptism. Instruction in, acceptance of, and a commitment to abide by the articles of religion, the elementary principles, and the authority of the Wesleyan Church in matters of church government. A commitment to live out the mission and vision of the Wesleyan Church through a discipling relationship within the church. The new member commits to a discipling relationship. The local church must accept responsibility to also commit to a discipling relationship with the new believer. To help the new believer grow, pursue holiness, and become more like Christ, may require changes and additions to our methods and programs. The final command that Jesus gave to his disciples is recorded in Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Disciples Making Disciples Perhaps the best evidence a disciple has been made is they in turn make a disciple. Membership reaffirmation is another piece of the discipleship strategy. It provides accountability for each member to affirm their continuing commitment to Christ and the church. Annually, members will be asked to reaffirm their acceptance of the Articles of Religion and Elementary Principles. 
the authority of the discipline in matters of church government and their willingness to continue a membership and discipleship accountability relationship with the church. Changes in Wesleyan Church membership mean that we are inviting baptized believers who fully agree and abide by our articles of religion to belong to the church and participate as members. Membership has become a path of discipleship. And so there is the basic changes. So uh, there was a model that basically said you believe, you, you become a follower of Jesus Christ, then you become and you, you really um, are living a, a holy, pure life, and then you can become an official member of the Wesleyan Church. Um, this become often included uh, in the old covenant member uh, commitments. There were certain uh, things that you could or could not do. That, that was sort of once you were willing to commit to doing or not doing certain things, then you could become a member of the Wesleyan Church. And then you could be belong. Well, the, the new model is this, that you believe... That, that you believe in Jesus Christ, that, that you can become, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and then they list four things that, that you must be willing to do as a member. And in fact, um, uh, Victor is doing a great job tonight because um, I'm going to ask him to do things on the fly. Uh, there are four things that you must be willing to commit um, commit to. Um, so Victor, if you could if you could get those. So they, they were, and I, I will just, I will walk through them. One is, um, there, there was baptism. That was the second one, that, that members, okay, there we go. The acceptance of the articles religion and, and acceptance of the elementary principles. And so the Wesleyan Church has a, a document, and we will, we will make this available on Facebook or somewhere in some avenue, has a, a document that really is our articles of religion. Uh, they, are, they are the key core things of what we believe, as well as our elementary principles. And so there's the acceptance of the articles of religion uh, and the elementary pr principles. Um, okay, this is the, the affirmation, which I'll get to. And the authority of the discipline in the matters of, of church government, the willingness to continue a membership and discipleship accountability relationship with the church. And so uh, now membership um, is, is the beginning of, of the discipling relationship, not just the end. Does that, does that make sense? So once someone comes to know Jesus Christ, they're, they're baptized, they're welcomed into the church, and then that process of becoming a disciple is part of the becoming. Um, yep, there it is. So those are membership requirements. The other uh, piece that is a part of this process is what the Wesleyan Church has established as an annual reaffirmation. Now, this is um, different than anything that we've ever had as membership of the Wesleyan Church before. What, what happened before was once you became a member, you were quasi a member for life. Now, now without a bunch of, um, I mean, there, that is not exactly true. Um, I mean, there's uh, some proceedings. If, if you do, if you did something really, you know, uh, immoral, there is a proceeding that can take place where you would no longer be members. Sometimes, um, at, at people, uh, churches would send out letters asking, um, "Do you still want to be a member of of this particular church?" Um, but now, the way it is established, every year. Uh, members of local Wesleyan congregations are going to be asked whether or not they want to reaffirm their membership in, in a particular Wesleyan church. The, 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 the interesting thing about that is that it becomes this accountability piece. 
I, you know, I told you this morning I'm a straight shooter. So um, there are people who are even members of, of this church, people I love, people you love, people we care about, who, because of just where they are in their spiritual journey, have not made faithful, regular attendance uh, to church, being engaged in, in the community, have not made that part of their life cycle at this moment. Membership, uh, one of the phrases that was often described it as is membership is moving from a status to a commitment. Membership is no longer a status where you say you are a member. Uh, membership is now a commitment where you are annually renewing your commitment to be engaged uh, in, in a community of faith. Um, obviously, there are there are nuances to this, you know, um, I'm going to pick on them, they don't know that. Nathan and Jade are, are going to be going back to Uganda. Just because they're going back to Uganda doesn't mean that we're going to say, well, because you're not here on a regular Sunday basis, you can no longer be a member of, of, of Brookhaven and Wesleyan Church. But it does give an accountability piece where church leaders can have hard conversations with people and sit across the table from them and say, you know, you have not been engaged in this community of faith. We're not even saying you're not a Christian. We're saying that you're not engaged in this community of faith. And membership in this community of faith is about commitment, not about a status. Um, this was not a, uh, a proceeding that happened just on a whim. Here's, let me just, uh, just, come, just come to me. This is the way that it, it processes uh, and I'm not a church law expert, but but these things are recommended to the general conference through some district, has a memorial, has an action item. It get, it goes to our general conference. The general conference votes on it. So our district elected representatives from our district of, of the Westland Church. We are part of the Crossroads District of the Westland Church, which is basically the north northern half of Indiana from basically Indianapolis on. And so um, we... You know, we had delegates that went to General Conference. Dave Tippy, who is a member here, was one of our delegates. And so it was voted on at, at General Conference. And then it had to be sent back to all the individual districts of the Wesleyan Church. And it had to be voted on and approved by every individual district of the Wesleyan Church collectively. I mean, there had to be um, a collective um, passage of, of at least... Two thirds, I believe, right, Ed? Two thirds. And so, uh, by at, at least two thirds, more than that, it was, um, it was passed that this would become the new, member, the new membership pathway of the Wesleyan Church. And so, uh, we don't get it as like an option. <laughs> you know, we get it as, as being part of the larger community. This is what the new membership pathway is. Um, there, um, there's some other little nuances that are, are part of it. One of them is the fact that um, we are uh, elected officials, elected members who, who are elected for certain key positions like, like board members and elected positions within the church. Um, they are actually required to a commit to a higher standard of, of some of the same things that were a part of our original member, our covenant membership um, requirements. And so if, if a person is going to be on the board, then they have to, um, they have to commit to some, a certain set of, of standards in, in certain areas as well. Because we believe that some of those things that were a part of our original covenant membership um, uh, requirements are still great things for followers of Jesus Christ to do or, or not to do. You know, um, we're just saying that if you become a believer and, and you want to become a member of the church, we are going to bring you in and we're going to disciple you towards what it means to live a transformed life. Now, does, uh, I, I'm, I am being really brave. Some might say stupid. Um, um, is there any point of clarification that I need to make about this new change in membership um, the new membership pathway. Ed, anything I need to clarify? Okay. 
And so at the end of the month, which is our plan, the, the district has asked us uh, really at the end of the month to, we, they didn't mandate it, but they would like for us to begin to shoot for this. At the end of, of January, we will ask uh, everyone who, who is a member or uh, if you're not a member and, and you're just a new believer uh, or, or for some reason you have not been a member in, in the past for uh, there's a lot of reasons that, that may have played out there, but you would like to be a member of, of the Wesleyan Church. Um, the membership requirements are very, very basic. And, and we listed those. So at the end of the month, we're going to give everyone the opportunity to reaffirm or not reaffirm their uh, their membership in this local community of faith. Does that make sense? Is this as clear as mud? Yes. Um, we will still make those as opportunities for people to just know what we believe. And, and honestly, uh, Bob, I think we will, uh, maybe on an annual basis, we will actually, so because what's going to happen here in a few moments is we'll, I'll spend the last uh, 15 minutes or so. Um, we're going to, this month, what we're going to do is we're going to start walking through some of our articles of religion of what we actually believe. This is actually going to be a teaching time where we begin to teach what it is we believe about certain things. Um, I, I've been a Wesleyan. I, my, I've been a Wesleyan all my life. I grew up in the church. And sometimes we, sometimes false teachings or nuances of teachings drift into the church. And, and there's sort of a popular theology that is out there. And so one of the things I think we'll do, Bob, is um, we'll still have some of those. But I think on an annual basis, we'll sort of come back together again. And, and once again, very basically, uh, walk through what it what it is that we believe. Does that make sense? Other questions? Yes. Great question, Sue. Um, they will um, because of circumstances, and and you know we we there will be some natural reaffirmation that takes place because you know we we know that there are saints of the church who. Who I, I don't mean to be harsh. Who, who mentally may not even you know have capabilities to make some decisions, and and so there the church leadership um, still you know uh, cares about those people who are members of our church, and and some of it will be as simple as as walking into visiting someone and say you want to be a member of Brookhaven still right okay that's awesome or or if they can't um, you know we'll just we'll we'll know that they have been a part of our community and we'll just um, make that happen. I think the accountability piece is something that we really, uh, that, that is one of the, the, the really crucial pieces of this because it's, um, it gives church leadership and uh, the opportunity to have some of those hard conversations with people who, have, uh, who may be struggling in their faith. They may just need someone to come along beside them and say, you know, um, just what's going on? Any other questions? Yes. Yes, it is. Yeah, in fact, that was one of the things that was brought up actually by Dave Tippy at our at our district conference when we were talking about it at a district conference level, and it came back to us to vote on. Um, Dave Tippy uh, got up and spoke and said, "This really is." It puts a lots lots of responsibility on the church to be discipling people. Um, if we do not disciple people who have accepted Christ, um, then we will miss a huge opportunity. Other questions? Well, um, like I said, um, this this. Well, I mean, for some of you, it might be exciting. This may not be completely exciting for all of you, but we are going to spend some time this month walking through some of our, our basic beliefs. And uh, someone I want to invite up to the platform uh, to the join me at the table is Mike Brown. Mike Brown is my dear friend. Mike Brown um, is um, a great resource for me. And um, me and Mike are going to have just a, a conversation 
about a, a couple things tonight. One of the things that we believe in as a church is the Trinity. And, uh, and so, Victor, go ahead and go to that um, slide sh uh, show that has our belief. Uh, oh, yeah, let, let, me, let me go there. That's the first one I want to do, Victor. Here is a summary of our beliefs um, as a Wesleyan church. This is actually off, off of our, our website. Uh, Wesleyans believe in one God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Savior of all who put their faith and say and the savior of all who put their faith in him alone for eternal life we believe those who are made new in Christ are called to be holy in character and conduct and can only live this way by being filled with the lord's spirit we believe in the bible and its sufficiency to establish our faith and conduct we believe god wills for people everywhere to know him and be made new in Christ we believe that the purpose of the church is to worship God in spirit and in truth and to reach a lost and fallen world with the gospel of Jesus Christ through its worship, witness, and loving deeds. And so that is our basic summary of what we believe as a church. If, uh, if you want, I'll just encourage you, uh, and Victor, I, I want to tell you that uh, there's a, a PowerPoint presentation that have all of our articles of religion and our elementary principles. Uh, you can start going to that. Um, I would encourage you to go to the wesleyan.org. That's our, our website. Uh, it, it's a great place that lays out some of our basic beliefs and, and who we are, some structure things. And so um, I encourage you to do that. So um, our first thing that we're going to talk about is faith in the Holy Trinity. And here's what we believe. This is straight from our Articles of Religion. It's kind of a condensed version a little bit. We believe in the one living and true God, eternal, unlimited, the creator, preserver of all things, with this unity, there are three persons of one essential nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, Mike, let's talk. Uh, the word Trinity, or, or the uh, basic teaching of, of the Trinity, is not something that's clearly laid out in the Bible. It is a sort of a collection. Can you explain to us, to me, how the church began to um, develop this idea throughout church history? Sure. Um, one of the things that the church really struggled with initially was uh, how can a man be divine? And so that was really the issue at stake because the, 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 the Old Testament God talks about God being one and being unified. And he's not like humanity. He's separate from humanity. If they had been in a Greek context, an ancient Greek context, the idea of a God being human would not be that difficult. Zeus did that. But the problem was that you're talking about Jews. And Jews believed in a God who was completely transcendent. He was outside of space and time. And so Jesus comes into the scene and he starts talking and acting and behaving in a way that says, in some way or shape or form, I'm divine. Uh, a great example of that is he calls himself the way, John 14, 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Um, another one is in uh, Matthew uh, tw uh, 9, 2. He says that he forgives sins. The only person who can forgive sins is God. Once again, you go to a Greek context, this isn't a hard conversation. You start talking about Jews and this gets very difficult and very strange. So the question becomes, how is Jesus both God and man? How does that relationship work? And so the Trinity is an attempt to understand and explain how Christ can be both God and man. And the church wrestled with this for a long time because that relationship was just wasn't very clear. Okay. And so, so you mentioned two of them. Now bring in the, the third part of that, which would have been the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Uh, it says Matthew 28. He says, uh, go and baptize and uh, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and then the Holy Spirit. So there's three and this mentioned by Christ. So the question becomes, what is their relationship? How do they work together? Are we talking about Three gods? Are we talking about one God? What is that relationship like? Okay. Uh, there has been some heresies that have developed over... Um, thank you very much. There have been some heresies or false teachings uh, about this, the way this plays out throughout church history. Uh, what are some of those false teachings or um, misconceptions that have developed throughout the years, throughout church history, about what the Trinity was? Mm -hmm. What is it actually not? Well, there, the church went through a lot of, uh, of ideas. People would step forward and say it's like this, and the church would really wrestle with that. And this was not a simple process. It was the church really working through it. One of the heresies that came across was what we call modalism. 
And in modalism, the best way to think about it is to think of it, I'm a father, I'm also a husband, I'm also an employee at office. So I would come home and I would say, honey, I love you, and I'd kiss her in the cheek. And then I would, I would go to my son and I'd say, I would put on my father hat, and now I'm disciplining my son. And then I'd go to work and I'd get a paycheck. That's modalism. In modes, like yeah, it, certain modes. It, it, yes. Think of it like a ball cap. Yeah. So when, when God came to earth in Christ, he wore a human hat. But as soon as he came back into heaven, he put on God the creator hat. And when he interacts with us as, as the, his people, he would wear a I'm the Holy Spirit hat. The church didn't accept this. And the main reason it didn't accept this is because that would mean a couple of things. One, who was Jesus praying to in the Garden of Gethsemane? That was the conflict. That's the conflict. Who is he praying to? Is he praying to himself? Is he praying to uh, to uh, like some kind of inner person within him that he's having a conflict? Is he pretending? Is he pretending to the apostles? I really don't want to die, but I know I have to die. So I'm going to pretend that I'm really sweating this out. It was Jesus really praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. And if he is, then modalism doesn't work. So the church responded to that by, by if you if you can, uh, the church's response to that was tritheism, because that's the next step, right? If you're going to go from modalism, while well, Jesus was praying in the garden, well, then it must be tritheism. And what that meant was there are three distinct independent entities. Well, then you go back to the Old Testament where Deuteronomy, it says, I, the Lord, your God, am one. I am one God. I, I, I have one nature. I am one being, one entity. There's not three gods that are hanging out in heaven and, and one decides that he's going to go to earth. Tritheism solved the problem of uh, who is Jesus praying to, but it caused another problem with, aren't we worshiping three gods now? Doesn't that make us polytheistic? So the church kind of goes, well, if it's not modalism and it's not tritheism, well, what they decided to do was some kind of a subordinationism. And there was a guy by the name of Arius, and he said, well, there's one God, the Father, and he created a son. At the beginning of time, and he gets this out of Philippians, and he says, there was a time when Jesus didn't exist. And so God the Father created Jesus the Son. That preserved God's unity, and it preserved Jesus' individuality. But what that does is it removes his divinity. No longer is Jesus divine. So the church really wrestled with this. It almost bought into Arianism because it really seemed to solve those issues. But in the end, it came back to, well, then Jesus isn't divine. And a guy by the name of Athanasius said that there's no, if Jesus isn't divine, then what he has done is he's built a bridge between humanity and some lesser creature. Okay. If, if Jesus is God, he has built a bridge between humanity and God. Unless Jesus is God, there's no bridge from humanity to God. There's only a bridge from humanity to some amazingly awesome and really powerful and wonderful being, but he's not divine. So the church really wrestled with, okay, so what does that mean? And it comes back around to the Trinity is not modalism. It's not tritheism. And it's not some form of subordinationism. Jesus is fully God, fully man, fully divine, fully human. It's, it's a mystery. Yeah, it's the mystery, I think, that, that we wrestle with yeah. a lot. Um, um, one of the, me and you, we've had this conversation. One of the ways that we, we talked about this was this idea of Trinity in its essence and mm. Trinity in its economy. Yes. And so let's, let's push in on that a little bit. What, does, what is the Trinity in its essence and what is it in its economy and what does that mean? Well, there's what's called the economic trinity, and then there's what's called, what the technical term is ontological trinity. Uh, I'll explain that in just a moment. The economic trinity is how the divine interacts with the world. Okay. Uh, the ontological trinity is how the divine interacts with itself. So the economic trinity says this, God the Father is the creator of the universe. He's the creator of everything. God the Son is the redeemer. He redeems and sustains the world. He has made the bridge between God and man. God the Holy Spirit is the sanctifier. He comes into our hearts. He, he, he modifies our life. He conforms us into the, into the character and nature of God. And so this is how God acts. And so we use the word economy. And it just means how God relates to the world. The ontological trinity becomes, well, how do they interact amongst themselves? What are they in and of themselves? And this is where it gets really dicey because at this point, you're kind of running into philosophy. 
you're kind of saying, well, I think the son relates like this, and I think the father relates like that, but if he's not interacting with us, how do you know that? Well, kind of a guess. <laughs> it isn't very clear. So there's what's called the economic trinity, and it's the, it's the uh, ontological trinity. Yeah. What I want to do, actually, just to put it up there, is I want to uh, put right after that is actually our three statements on each of those. Um, our, our, the next one is the Father. We believe the Father is the source of all that exists, Creator, whether of matter or spirit, with the Son and the Holy Spirit. He made man in His image. All right? As far as the Son, our statement says, we believe in Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, truly God and truly man. He died on the cross and was buried to be a sacrifice both for original sin and for all human transgressions and to reconcile us to God. Christ rose bodily from the dead and ascended into heaven and there intercedes for us at the Father's right hand. And so that's our statement of what we believe uh, about the Son. And then the next one is uh, our, just our statement on the Holy Spirit. We believe in the Holy Spirit who proceeds from the Father and the Son and is of the same essential nature, majesty, and glory as the Father and the Son, truly and eternally God. As we read those sort of in tandem, um, one of the questions that I think we have is, how do each of these play out in our own spiritual lives? Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, you're, you're, you're going back to the economic trinity. How do we interact with this? How does it, why does this matter? Well, it kind of matters because it plays out in the way that you're praying to. Uh, we pray to the Father. God the Father is the one who is in control of everything. He is God the Father. And we pray through the Son. Jesus is the one who has made that way possible. He's the one who's made it capable for us to approach God, the creator, the sustainer, and, the, and the, 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 the originator of all life. And we pray by the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit. So when we pray, the Spirit of Christ, the Holy Spirit, enters into us. And we pray through Jesus to God the Father for whatever it is that we have requests in our life. This is why when we pray, we pray in Jesus' name. In G when, we, when you're praying and you're praying with your children and you say, in Jesus' name I pray, amen, you are following the economic trinity. You're following through with, this, with the way it's supposed to work. We pray to God the Father through the Son in the, in the Holy Spirit so that the Spirit acts within us, guides us, leads us, works within us. We th pray through what Jesus has done for us and we pray to the Father to act on our behalf. And what's really, really fascinating about this is that means that Jesus is the one who advocates for us. It says in Hebrews that it was fitting that God should make the author and perfecter of our faith perfect through suffering. What that means is that um, Jesus knows what it means to be frail in a way that the Father cannot know. And that doesn't mean that the Father is somehow deficient. What the Father lacks is imperfection. The Son carries our imperfection for us. So that is how he's able to go to the Father and say, you know, Mike is just a real doofus. He really messes up a lot. <laughs> I know what that's like. I know what that's like, Father. I've had hands. I've had feet. I know what that feels like. Here's what I think you ought to do. And the Holy Spirit comes into our heart and helps us and molds us and changes us. So this is why the Trinity really does matter. It matters in how we pray. It matters in how we live. And it matters in, in the life that comes out of us. We are led by the Holy Spirit to pray to God the Father through Jesus Christ, his Son. Any other just... Um, um... Once again, we're going to be brave, me and you. I think we talked about this. Any quick questions uh, about the Trinity and, and, and just our understanding? Not that, not that it's not a mystery. Uh, Nathan. Oh, great, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> I have his theolo simple theology at home on my shelf. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, I have found, to be honest, the easiest way to explain the Trinity is with a heresy. I, I, I mean it dead serious. The easiest way to explain the Trinity is with a heresy because it makes much more, those heresies made much more sense. They seem to function better, but it doesn't hold true to the scripture. 
So oftentimes what I will do is I will teach a heresy to a new believer, not because I believe that, but because it's easier to understand. Uh, so what I'll talk about a lot is how I can be a father and a, and, a, and a husband and a worker. And I'll explain that. Now, it's modalism. It's straight up modalism. It's straight up heresy. But you're not dealing with a PhD in, in theology here. You're dealing with a person who's not able to wrap his head around it. So what I'll do is I'll oftentimes deal with heresies, not because they're right. Let me say that again. Not because they're right, but because you're in a, you're in a, a communication that has to go fast. And then that becomes a, a bridge to, to actually move on Absolutely. from that. Absolutely. You, you don't just start there. You, you don't just stop there. You start there, and then you start moving deeper. And you talk about, well, you know, that's modalism. And we don't really believe in modalism. But it's a great place to start. And uh, there's a lot of other heresies. Trust me, if, you're, if you think you've got the Trinity down, usually it's a heresy. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm dead serious. I'm dead serious. Because the Trinity is extremely difficult to really get. Because it's actually understand best by what it isn't. Uh, Augustine used that illustration. And what he said is, uh, because if you go to ice, steam, and liquid, that's modalism. So what Augustine did is he said, there's, a, there's the ocean, there's a source for a stream, and then there's a, a river. So he talked about it in, in, in ways that are very, it, we would think ice, uh, steam, and water would make sense. That's modalism. So once again, it becomes a, a gateway, a gateway conversation piece. Absolutely. You don't, the, this is a starting a conversation. This isn't an ending a conversation. Because trust me, where I'm at in my life, I still don't understand the Trinity. I don't know how you can have three people with one nature and one essence. I don't know how that works. I trust that it's, that it's so. I don't know how that it's so. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, Paul. Try that one more time. Whose ministry? Wow. <laughs> so glad you asked that question. Um, obviously, the church is God's. The church doesn't belong, doesn't belong to us. It's not ours. We don't possess it. We don't own it. The church is God's. Now, the, the redeeming part of the church was the work of, of Christ. The, the, absolutely. The redeeming part of 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 what we are in the reconciliation of us to God was the work of, of, of Christ. Christ, Christ the... has redeemed us in a way that's objective, meaning his work has been done in the past. 2,000 years ago, it was completed and it was finished. When we're all, we talk to children, we say things like, do you want to ask Jesus in your heart? We say that all the time. And in terms of ec economy, that's okay. You're, you're functioning in what a person can understand. But in reality, you're not asking Jesus into your heart. You're asking the Holy Spirit into your, your heart. So the Holy Spirit is what actually enters all believers. Now, it's called the Spirit of Christ because Christ was here. But what did Christ do at the ascension? He went to heaven and he said, I'm in heaven and I'm going to send a comforter. If I don't go away, I can't send a comforter. So he went to heaven to take his rightful place as heir to the universe and sent us the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, economically, is the one who actually operates in all of us. But it doesn't sound very great to go, do you want to ask the Holy Spirit into your heart today? That, that doesn't really ring true in terms of, uh, what am I doing? Well, you're asking Christ to be Lord of your life through the Holy Spirit. And you're, and you're subjected to the Father through the Holy Spirit because of what the son did. Yeah. And so we'll get to this when we get to holiness and, and sanctification. I think one of the things of our, of our Wesleyan tradition is that we assume that the, the Holy Spirit's work in our, in our life only happened at some work of grace, of, of holiness or sanctification. But all believers have, have the spirit at work within, within our lives. Absolutely. Did that answer your question? Was that good enough? or? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So we will continue. Um, we will continue this month unpacking some of these things. We, uh, me and Mike have talked. I think next week we're planning on going, talking about sin and maybe atonement. 
and, and what that means. And there's all kinds of of nuances of of what that what that may look like. Um, you know, we'll we'll we will begin to unpack some of these articles of of religion and 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 really just try to 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 work and answer some questions about what what these things mean. But um, yes. It, yes. Absolutely. There's, there's a, when you ask Christ into your life, you are asking the Holy Spirit to come into your life. Now, we don't talk about it like that, but that's what's supposed to be happening is the Holy Spirit is in, entering into you. In a, as Wesleyans, we would kind of say in, a, in a, an initial kind of a form. It isn't the fully, a full spiritual possession. It really, it's more along the line of you've invited Jesus into your, um, your, your dining room. In some ways, to put it in a, in a very uh, household way, when you're, when you're talking about sanctification, you're talking about taking him into every, every room and showing him your entire house. In some ways, when you're converted and you ask Christ into your life, you've welcomed him maybe into your doorway, maybe into your den, and you're sitting him down and you're having conversations. That's crude, but I hope that, does that, that, that point that out? Yes. Yeah, yeah, and th that's all kind of part of what we're talking about here. Is sure. The Holy Spirit is part of this process of discipleship. We, ha we have come to know Christ. We have the Holy Spirit, but we're giving the Holy Spirit more and more and more and more. Uh, I, I grew up in the Wesleyan Church, and so I had a pastor who used to say, you don't swim into a pool. That's what he said. You jump into a pool, and then you swim around. And that kind of gives this idea of status, that you have earned sanctification now. You can check that box and move on. Uh, I don't know that that's necessarily, that isn't what Wesley taught. It was this kind of this idea of you're continually growing in faith and in life from the time you were converted until the time of death. And you're perpetually and continually growing. And so in some ways, this membership thing is kind of this little line where we're going, okay, they now have faith, they've been baptized, and we're going to draw this arbitrary line that says now you can be a member. But the reality is none of us are fully Fully members in the kingdom of God, really, till we're dead. All of us. None of us have truly been glorified until, we, until we're dead. I'm, I'm going to get preaching here in a minute. <laughs> yes. Is there, yes, we are. Yes. And you can get my book up in the back for 1995. <laughs> I'll be signing copies. <laughs> That's I'm great. just kidding. That's great. Thank you so much. I hope it has been helpful to you, and we will continue to to unpack this stuff. And uh, if you have que you know, if we have questions, if you have questions afterwards, ask Mike. Uh, no, no. <laughs> but uh, let's pray, guys. We come to you. We thank you so much for this time together. These moments that we've had to worship you to. Uh, you hear what it is that you want to say to us um, through uh, your word as it has um, really been um, formative within our hearts and lives. And so, God, I pray that as we go from this place that we will continue to just seek ways to um, live out our life. In, in Jesus' name, amen. You are sent out.